the, the, the first talk now is by Dick Willis, a long-time great friend of mine. I'd, I first met him before the 1975 New Guinea expedition, and, and Dick went with us there, and he's been caving with us ever since. So without any more ado, I'd like to pass, pass over to Dick. Thanks, Andy. The, the challenge I've got, being of almost senior years, not quite 50 years in caving, but almost, is that if I stand far enough away from here to be able to see the notes on the screen, you won't hear me through the microphone. So um, I might pause and put my glasses on. But, so 50 years of overseas expeditions, 50 years of, of absolute wonder. Um, but the biggest wonder for many people is, is, is this one, really. Um, how do you justify 50 years of huge expense in some cases and some enormous discomfort and I think you, you know you have to think about why people do go caving and particularly why they go caving overseas and there's an immediate and very obvious reason for that and and that's that's this this is the um, if you want to explore caves and you want I Frank would have said this of course or something very similar if you want to explore caves, this is, this is how you do it if you want to find anything decent, you have to go dig it. And um, this is Rob Avis, Andy's youngest son and lookalike. And um, I mean, really and truly, that answers my question, doesn't it? Why go caving overseas? Why wouldn't you? Why would you want to do? Why would you want to do that? When actually, you can buy an airline ticket and you go to somewhere like Sarawak and you can walk into something like this. This is the Clearwater Cave System in in Mulu. Um, it's now 226 kilometres of surveyed passage. It's uh, a fantastic, huge river cave. And uh, above it is a complex network of dry passages. We've got... Um, and it's still going. We're still exploring stuff there. We've just broken into a completely different part of the world. So maybe, maybe one reason for going caving overseas is that you don't want to do what Rob Evis was doing. Um, which I have to say is, hard. you know, you go abroad to play, find things like this and you come back and people treat you as a demigod. Well, they used to. Um, and uh, actually, the demigods are the people who really put the effort in and do stuff in the UK. So that's, that's, that's one reason. Maybe, maybe the reason why we go abroad is, to, is a matter of national pride. Because, you know, we have to remember that the first person to descend Britain's longest open-air shaft was a Frenchman. And, um, and, you know, I mean, that is real national pride. I mean, sorry, if there's anybody in the audience who's French, there has been a little bit of rivalry between the countries ever since. So, so we had to restore that. And actually, we did restore that because in 1963, uh, a team led by Ken Pierce went to the bottom of the Gouffre Berger in France, which was then the deepest cave in the world. They dived the sump at the bottom and they made the cave deeper. So we stole the world depth record back from the French. So national pride was justified. Um, but it could be that we just go caving overseas or go caving at all, really, because the British have got this sort of psyche that demands that you do ridiculous, futile, risky things, which could account for Brexit. Um, <laughs> and because, of course, you know, it's a well-known fact that the British are really into, into, into character-forming activities, and caving certainly is character-forming. Um, and there are some right characters. This is Colin Boothroyd and Tim Fogg, and Tim Speaker. Both of them are, speak both of them are speaking over the weekend, actually. And it's a lovely picture, because I always use it to illustrate why you should take your clothing sponsorship photos before you go caving... <laughs> And not afterwards. But by, by, by the 60s, we were really well established on the overseas expedition scene. We had groups caving in Jamaica, in northern Spain, uh, groups in northwest Greece on the Ostraca Plateau, and, uh, and of course in France. And some people were going you know, further afield eastwards. This is the Kermanshah Plateau in, in, uh, in Kurdistan, uh, Iranian Kurdistan. And uh, an expedition there in 1971, led by Dave Judson, went to explore a cave called the Garparau. And they, they explored it down to a depth of minus 742 metres where they ran out of gear and they could see the passage continuing around the corner. So they do what cavers always do, which is to, uh, to come back and you raise the money and you put the team together and you go back out. And as often happens, you descend the last pitch because you've now got the gear and you go around the corner and you make an additional nine metres of depth before they hit the sump. Uh, it's all too common, really. But they, 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 they came back from that. And uh, Dave, 
in an inspired way, and thanks very much to his colleagues who are on that trip, rather than divvy out the outstanding, because they made a profit, which is also very unusual, rather than divvy out the money between the two members, they decided to put that money into a fund to fund overseas caving expeditions. And the first, the first grants were made by the Garparau, what's now the Garparau Foundation, in 1974, and they've been giving out, <coughs> giving out grants ever since. And you can, you can see, I tried to build a clever slide that built them all in, but actually it was just too damn complicated. There's an awful lot of them. But you can see there that the, the, the most popular country, these are not all the caving expeditions, these are just the ones that applied to Garparau for funding. So we've had 110 funded expeditions to, to Spain, 50 to Austria, 65 to China, which only opened up in 1985, 26 to Mexico, so on and so forth. You know, the Garpra Foundation has been absolutely amazing at supporting British caving, and thanks to everybody who's involved in it. What amazed me when I put that slide together, 17 expeditions to Norway. It's cold, for God's sake. Let alone one to north, northeast Greenland, um, one to that little one spot that's sitting in the blue over on the right of the screen, which is the Cook Islands. And um, somewhere in the middle, somebody went to Monaco, why would you? I mean, I don't know who made that decision. But anyway, there you go. But that search for deep caves has, has been ongoing ever since, really. And in 1975, Andy mentioned that we went to Papua New Guinea. Twenty of us went for a six-month expedition to the highlands of New Guinea in the search of a, of a new depth record there. Well, we didn't break any depth records. And, uh, and you can see from that photograph of the late Dave Yendel down there that not all the caves were the massive tropical things that you've come to believe. But we did have the most fantastic time. And um, Bashir, there are at least four members of that team in this, this room at the moment, maybe somebody else hiding. Um, and we, you know, we had the real privilege of working with people like Yayok up there on the left, there with his mum, our chief porter. And it, it was a privilege to be with people. And that search for deep caves has gone ever since. And we've had a number of expeditions, mostly jointly with Russians and some Italians and various other nationalities, here to Uzbekistan. This is the Baisuntal Wall. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, long, uh, thousand metre high in most places, um, slope uh, cliff at the edge of a huge tilted plateau. And the cave, is, the entrance is riddled with two things. One is um, strikes from Russian fighter aircraft coming back from Afghanistan in bad weather and the whole of the Taylor Slope at the foot of that cliff is covered in aircraft debris. Um, and the other one is it's got cave entrances all over it, and there are searches there for a network of caves linking up, done by well, multinational teams, really, but, but led primarily by the Russians. And the Russians actually own the current depth record, which changed earlier this year. This is not a British caver. This is a, a lady called Talia uh, Yakupova, uh, comes from one of the Moscow caving clubs, and they took the record down to 2,204 metres. That's over two kilometres down. Um, and they did it in February, and they had to dig the entrance out through four metres of snow. So at the bottom of the cave, which is wet, and, and I mean really wet, they were exploring in streamways and swimming in meltwater at minus at two degrees, possibly three degrees. So it's a real feat. The Russians are staggeringly tough. Um, but there are other records, of course, and, and one of the other records is longest caves. We, we, we try in New Guinea. We set a new record at the time for the longest cave in the Southern Hemisphere, 20, 20 and a half kilometres, I think, this thing, Selminumtem, which was absolutely fantastic. It was slightly interrupted by having a rescue when um, Steve Crabtree wasn't looking where he was going, fell over an edge and bounced on his head, which is a bit of a shame, but there we are, he survived. Um, the current record for the longest cave in the world is held by the Americans in Mammoth Cave System, which... 651,784 metres of survey passage. So we're probably not going to beat that anytime soon, but we, we, we do continue to try. And in, in Mulu, where we started exploring in the 1977-78 uh, RGS expedition, we're into, into this. This is clear water again. And we have 226 kilometres of survey passage here, and it's still going. And in fact, cavers in the last couple of years have broken into completely new areas of the mountain and uh, you'll just see a little bit more later. But not all cave exploration is above water. An enormous amount of it is underwater. And uh, I'm not a cave diver, so I'm not going to talk about it at any length. But I'll just mention this one, which Chris mentioned earlier on. And uh, this is Pozo Azul in Spain. And uh, the dives here, there's nine kilometres of cave diving to get to the end of this cave. Eight to ten hours, I think, is the sort of time. 
And it's only possible, really, because of the technical development. So the, the diver there, John Valanthan, is diving on an oxygen rebreather, not just bottled air. You wouldn't stay down for long enough otherwise. And he's being pulled along by a motorised scooter. Um, probably can't use those in many British caves because they're too grotty and small and horrible. But, but uh, you know, in, in your middle night when you're lying awake, uh, just think about dive, cave diving being underwater with no airspace for nine kilometres, ten or nine or ten hours. Um, that's probably enough to give most people the screaming heebie-jeebies. So, big caves. And the media's got a real interest now in big caves. And for many years, this was the biggest cave in the world, the biggest chamber in the world, rather. This is the Lverna in the good for Pierre Saint-Martin, the French Pyrenees. And um, if I had a pointer, which I haven't, if you look on the left, you can see a beam of light coming out. There's a caver there with one of our new torches, which are very powerful. And over on the right, there's that big patch of, that big patch of light. Um, the way into the cave is through a tunnel. EDF screwed up. They were trying to capture the river and missed it by a long way. For a hydro scheme, you have to go down across the floor of the chamber, up that 60-metre wall on the right, and the, the way on is that triangular passage. The way into the main cave is actually up that way. This is the way to the bottom, and... Um, you can just see standing on that ledge a couple of little white figures and their cavers. Extraordinary place. But that chamber was completely blown away when in 1980 we found this. Well, I didn't find it, unfortunately. Um, this is Sarawak Chamber. This was for years, was the biggest chamber in the world, but we now know it isn't. It's the biggest chamber in the world by floor area, but it's not the biggest chamber by volume. That's the Miao Room in the Gabiha system in China. Mm -hmm. And that has a volume of 10.57 million cubic metres, whereas this one is only 9.81 million cubic metres. And now, I have to say personally that the, the entrance passage to this cave is one of the best bits of caving you can do in the world. It is absolutely fantastic. The chamber itself is staggeringly boring. It's this enormous black space full of loose boulders the size of houses. It's just dreadful. We spent three days in there. Um, photographing it in 1984. But just to give you an idea of, of how these things scale up, on that picture, over on the left, you can see Gaping Gill. That was the biggest chamber in, the, in, in Britain until it was pipped at the post by the, the frozen deep in Mendip, of all places, um, which is, uh, I think, the biggest by floor area. I think Gigi is probably bigger by volume. I'm looking at Pete there in case he disagrees with me. The red circle is the Verna, which is the big chamber I showed you just now in France. And the blue outline is Sarawak Chamber. Now, a couple of things to say about this. The first one is that those of you who read The Guardian will know that the unit of area that The Guardian uses is a Wales. They describe places as being three times as big as Wales. Cavers use a unit of distance as a jumbo jet. So um, this is the standard caving survey thing. So I'll just point that one out. The second thing is if you're talking about the biggest... There is no definition of what's the biggest. So if you were going to calculate the floor area of that chamber, leaving aside the facts and a slope, which complicates it, where do you draw the line? Do you draw it where the blue lines end? Do you draw it to the, the right of the gaping gill bit? Do you do that bit up the top there? You know, where do you draw? There is no definition of biggest, and you will later hear Howard say his caves in Vietnam are the biggest caves in the world, and of course they're not really, they're in Borneo, but... You know, let's not. That, 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 that jealousy thing drives us on a bit further. They are fantastic caves. I'm not going to argue that. But, but you have to take claims of biggest of a pinch of salt, really. Um, they're just enormous. And the really important thing is they're all explored by Brits, which is what we're here for. So we couldn't do any of this stuff these days, the way we do it, without developments in, in techniques and gear and clothing and so forth. So this, you'll have... <coughs> This is how we used to do, when I started caving, this is how we did vertical drops. This is a, a, a trip down the Berger in 68, I think it was, Tony, wasn't it? And um, you can see there that the, the guy's climbing a ladder, or uh, an electron ladder, and you have to have a lifeline life if you're climbing a ladder, because if the ladder breaks, and they used to break, the, the, the line gave you a chance of survival. And up the top there is a man with a pole. That pole was owned by Ferdinand Petzl. Um, <laughs> He's holding the ladder away from the water so the guy climbing the ladder doesn't get drenched by the stream. Now, it's all right. It's bloody tiring climbing ladders. I used to hate doing it. And the problem is that you've got to carry all that kit. You've got to carry all the ladders down the cave and you've got to carry the rope down the cave. So in the late 60s, early 70s, we adopted uh, a different technique called single rope techniques. And this is in a cave called Mia, uh, Malcung, 
which is in Wulong County in Chongqing in China. And this is, I think, uh, Phil, correct me, is this the second longest drop in the world underground? Um, it's half a kilometre deep, this pit, 500 metres deep. And it's done on single rope technique. So we've just done away with a ladder and you use a single rope. And in that film at the start, you saw people uh, ascending single ropes. We do it using ratchets to fit on the rope and you have a foot loop and a harness and you work your way out the rope and you go down it, sliding down using a, a friction device. And you have to fix the rope, of course. And when I started caving, we used natural belays, stalagmites and boulders and things like that. And if there weren't any, you were a bit stuffed. You couldn't fix it. Now we drive bolts into the rock. And that means that you can refix the rope to avoid sharp bits. You can refix it to avoid the water, so no more poles holding things out. And you can break the pitch up into stages. So on this enormous shaft, you can have several people ascending or descending the, the shaft at any one time because they're doing it in stages. And of course, if you're sticking bolts in the rock, we used to do that with a hand drill. So a hand drill, you hammer it in and blow the dust out. More often than not on expeditions now, we're using power, portable power drills. And they make the process much, far, <coughs> much faster. And, uh, and also they make the process of working upwards because you don't just use these rope techniques to go down, but actually if you go into a cave and find a vertical ascent, you would bolt, create a bolt ladder going up that. And these power drills um, make that much faster. So SRT has been an enormous development in caving. And one of the other major developments is in, in, in lighting, and with the lighting, the ability to fo get photographic records of the caves. So um, this was one of the first photographs taken of Sarawak Chamber in 1984. Each one of those patches of light is a string of five flash bulbs the size of a standard household bulb. They're strung together and they're triggered by a, a slave unit which is fired by picking up the flash from the flash on the camera. Each photo would take between two and three hours to take because the photographers would position us using walkie-talkies, fire everything off, take a Polaroid picture, look at the Polaroid picture, move everybody around to get the composition right, do it all over again. Incredibly tiresome. Um, but that's, how it, that's the only way we could do it. Now, cave photographers have the benefit of lights that can do things like this. They are about 600 quid a pop for the cheapest ones, but, you know, you can light up huge chambers. And that beam there across cloud ladder hall in China is, uh, is picking up a, a person on a rope in the middle of the chamber. Just to let you know how big that is, that funny little sort of thing that looks a bit like an owl in the corner isn't. It's a cross section of that chamber and on the right is the Eiffel Tower. That's another caving unit of distance. So, you know, these things are huge, but using, using modern lamps and digital cameras, good photographers can actually sort of paint the cave in. They can use the lamp to illustrate the walls and the camera will pick up the light. And it's a real art form. And, um, and that's an illustration of how it's done. So, uh, where are we now? Okay, well, we used to, there's also been huge developments in surveying caves and creating maps in caves. So the traditional way of doing that is to, is to use a tape measure. You go in as part of a team. You'd have a tape measure to measure the distance between two points. You'd have a, a clinometer to measure the vertical angle between those two points and a compass to measure the, the, the horizontal angle. And another member of the team, just to prove I do go caving, um, another member of the team notes down the readings and does a sketch of the cave as they go through. Then you come out of the cave, you plot up the, uh, the coordinates on a big sheet of graph paper and, um, and you, you draw the cave around using the sketch from the cave. Very sociable process. But of course these days, you know, nothing, changes, nothing stays the same, does it? These days you have a gadget and uh, the gadget does all the measurements for you and it records the measurements and it ships it out to a PDA, a digital device, and you draw the sketch on the PDA uh, and then you go back to the camp and you press a button more or less and it ships it out to a computer. And uh, everybody does that sitting around with headphones in listening to music. So one of the real advantages of going caving, which is you have a real, uh, the crack as the Irish would say, that's all gone because people are sat there with headphones. I hate it personally, but there we go. Um, developments in, in cave surveying. And that means we can survey caves to a much higher level of accuracy. And if you want to go a level of accuracy beyond this, and Ree Waters will be talking about it over the weekend, you can actually map caves in three dimensions using a LIDAR device, a laser detection and ranging device like this. And uh, you can create a 3D image of the cave and then with clever software you can turn that inside out so you can, you can see the cave from the inside and you can take photography of the cave walls, map that onto the 3D image and you can create a fly-through 
And uh, if you're here for the weekend, do go to Rue's talk because he shows you how that's done. And all of that, of course, means that you can also you can also display caves in a much better way in journals and publications for the average person. You'll see there yet again the use of the 747 as a, as a unit of size. It's a bit tricky, that one, really, because they're bigger now than they used to be, aren't they? So there's no right, direct comparison between this picture from National Geographic with a 747 of scale and the picture I showed you earlier. This is uh, the Meow Room in Kabiha. This is the, the, the chamber that's bigger than Sarawak Chamber in volume. And it, there's arguments about it because some people say that isn't a chamber, it's two chambers linked by a big passage, but who cares? It's huge. So we've been going to China for a long time, since 1985, and, and China has got something like 70% of the world's cast, so the potential for more exploration there is absolutely stunning, and it's been going on for a long time. One of the, one of the best systems that we explore there is the Daifeng system. And it, this started off as a, a, as a small valley, and in the bottom of the valley was a small uh, a dip, became a trench, and the trench developed over a period of, over a distance of 11 kilometers into this canyon. Now, the canyon is uh, at the point at which it goes underground. In other words, the canyon roofs over. It's about 200 metres deep and only a few metres across at the top. And the river, because it's a much bigger river by that point, goes underground into, into this, uh, which is a complete milestone. And exploring this cave downstream is extremely difficult and extremely dangerous and hasn't been completed. A Chinese group's just been back there to, to try and do it. And it involves creating a ladder wall, a ladder uh, uh, sorry, a bolt system along the side so that you stay out of the water. You have to use uh, radio mics to communicate because the noise of the water is, is too much. Um, we know where it comes out. It comes out through this. This is a, a passage a bit further down in, in the side of the Shaozai Dolin, uh, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. This is absolutely stunning. Uh, canyon passage and we've explored here upstream for a for a kilometer but the two bits the downstream lead and the upstream lead don't meet there's a 500 meter gap in the middle and at some stage it will be done so this is where the the, the river appears this is the Shaozai Dolin it's 660 meters deep with a volume of 119 million cubic meters it's just enormous and the passage you can see there is that one out of which the river comes and the river crosses the floor of the Dolin and then goes underground again but most of it actually doesn't because they've, they've put a tunnel in and it, they take the water off for a hydro scheme. But it goes underground again and then it reappears five kilometres later into daylight here. This is a picture I nicked off Facebook, actually, taken by a Chinese. That's a group of Chinese cavers there on that ledge. And when we did this system, the, the river itself is at the bottom of this slot and it resurges in a waterfall, a 40-metre waterfall down to the, to, the, to the bottom of that gorge which is a closed canyon, and on the opposite wall is another waterfall coming out. So there's loads of stuff to do here. And um, the, uh, the explorations are going on in China all the time. That photo I showed you earlier um, of Miao Kung, uh, that's part of what is now the deepest cave system in France, a network of caves linked together by a group called the Hong Magui Cave Exploration Group, which is a multinational collaboration, not just Brits, they're very well represented in it, but uh, a multinational collaboration of cavers exploring, exploring caves in China. Um, so but I think that illustrates one of, the, one of the most impressive things about British overseas expeditions is we have this long-term commitment to different areas. Um, uh, Mula we've been going back to since 1978, and I'll just show you this one. This is, this, is, this is how it started off. This is after 78. There's caves we had after 78. And this is how it is almost now. You see all those black lines appearing at the side and uh, Sarawak chamber you can see on there. And uh, we're still going back. We're going back in, in January. We've got 484 kilometres of surveyed passage. But there are lots of other places. This is uh, Meghalaya in northeast India where a succession of, of uh, expeditions since 1992. Partnerships again of European... Um, British and, and Indian cavers have been, have been caving there. Some fantastic river caves, and uh, they've got 455 kilometres of surveyed cave over there, 28 expeditions over the years, and, uh, and also some interesting caves in quartzitic sandstones, dry, very complex networks of caves. But the area we've been to most is, is, is northern Spain, or Spain, and uh, the cloud there fills the Carries Gorge. If you're familiar with the Picos de Europa, 
the Carries Gorge bisects the Peak Costa Europa, and Lancaster University first went there in 1979 on the south side. Oxford University first visited this area. Uh, sorry, Lancaster went in 70. Oxford first visited it in 19 in 1979. Around here, this is the Ario Refugio. And uh, I've been going back. And there's another area further east in Cantabria that Manchester picked up um, uh, and where they've been, they've been caving, Matienza, where they've been caving for years. So this is what they dream of doing in, in, in the Ario area and over the, over the other side in Trezviso, of linking up the cave systems from the high Picos and linking them together to create a, a, a continuous network to where the rivers come out at the bottom in the Carries Gorge or on the other side of the Massif. And uh, this involves an awful lot of very heavy logistical work, getting the gear there, camping underground for long periods of time, shipping diving gear to the, to the, to the bottom of the, of, of the cave to, to dive the connections because they're often flooded. And I think this slide illustrates what, it, what it's about, really. These are the, the 39 expeditions that have been to the Ario area, involving 921 cavers over that period of time. There's a little blue dot on the, on the one in 1981, because that's me, because I went there. Um, and it's fantastic. And, uh, and, and that really illustrates and a really important point about expedition caving is it's the people. The people you go with, whatever their nationality, the locals that you're caving with or working with and the people in your team are the people who make it. So the exploration is great, but it's the people that create the real satisfaction and an addiction to it. Now, I want, to, uh, I want to just finish off with two short, they are fairly short video sequences. So the first one was put together for me by Sid Peru. Thank you, Sid. This shows how it was. Carbide, Donnie. Uh, you yeah, a bit, uh, it's in. Around here someplace. How much you got? You got enough for, say, four or five pills? Yeah. How long you're going to take us? Ten hours, really, but it could be 20 hours at least. Mm. You've got plenty of food on. Oh, some chocolate. He's light when he comes out. That's the best thing. Yeah. That's it, Howard. Whoops. Is it gone? Yep, good. Oh, <laughs> this was the route. An easy walk into the Salverna, and then a difficult climb. In the dark, up the far wall and into the meanders. Tight and awkward passages, before the vertical descent into the Puy Parment. Electron ladders and wetsuits are the modern caver's gear. They are called wet because they trap a thin film of water between your body and the suit. In a sense, you are kept warm by your own wetness. In a cave as cold as the Pierre St. Martin, uh, you really can't afford to stop still for a long time because otherwise you're in fact, your body temperature is going to fall very drastically and you're going to be in trouble. I mean, everybody's got to be doing something. Making their own heat. Yeah. Making their own heat, yeah. yes. On pitches like these, they lifeline a man down, tie a rope around his body, and pay it out as he descends the ladder so that if he does slip off, or the ladder should break, he still has a chance. Ahead, the advance party have already laddered three more pitches, but always in the back of their minds is the thought of the return, of conserving enough energy to climb back up. Everybody does their own job. You have a person who was best at rigging pictures, another person who was good at climbing, another person who was a good wriggler. He's the man for the tight bits and this sort of thing. And the whole team completely changes character for every different obstacle. has formed. It's, it's tantalizingly close now. Nothing on earth would make me get into water that cold and this deep in a cave. Fucking hell. Both valves free flow. I couldn't shut them down. You 
don't have guaranteed success. You know, the top of the mountain isn't there, you can't see what you're going to find. Because caves don't kind of give up their secrets very easily. So you've just got to live in the hope that eventually you will make connections. I think many, many years of hard work has actually started to really pay off. The Gar Pratt Foundation, is, uh, thanks very much to them, because since they started in 74, they funded this lot of, uh, of expeditions, and they've been fantastic. And my personal thanks to the people who provided the photos. None of them were mine, and I want to leave you with this quote. <laughs>